All right, so to get up ourselves a running start for our congruence axioms dealing with line segments, we had three of them. And as a reminder, just like with points, with lines, with betweenness, the actual definition of how you define two line segments to be congruent to each other is given inside of your model once you have it. So this here just says, assuming that you have some way to define whether two line segments are congruent to each other, these now are our three axioms. So to remind ourselves, the first congruence axiom roughly said, take any line segment, you can copy it anywhere else in the geometry. That's totally a lie. You can copy it to some array you have in the geometry. In something like an R2 model, that literally means you can copy it anywhere you want. In something like a Z2 model where you're dealing with integers or a Q2 model where you're only dealing with fractions, you have to watch out for where your rays are. The second congruence axiom was the one that was logic. It totally just dealt with how you can manipulate your uh, congruence equations. So here, if A, B is congruent to both C, D, and E, F, well, all three line segments are congruent to each other, and every line segment is congruent to themselves. No picture associated with this one. Last congruence axiom here, we actually found at the end of last time, that's not the only way that you can write this. We also said that if you have a distance formula, this guy is exactly the same as saying that if you've got three points A, B, and C, you should be able to find that the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C should definitely equal the distance from A to C. In other words, that thing that you thought was always true. Okay? So this is a way of rewriting the third congruence axiom using the distance formula. Again, you have to have the distance formula in your model in your model as a way to define con uh, line segment congruence to use that. Okay. So that's where we've been. Now the new stuff. So we have actually a total of six congruence axioms. The last three all deal with angles. And they totally mimic the line segment congruence axioms. If you figure out the idea for line segments, angles is easy. So remember, first line segment congruence axiom dealt with copying a line segment. The second one was logic, and the third one was adding line segments. So with angles, the first congruence axiom for angles, not creatively named C4, says you've got some angle, you've got some ray, then there exists a unique second ray here that is exactly going to correspond to the first angle when you copy it to the ray DF. In other words, you can copy an angle to any ray in your geometry. Okay. Now this unique here, eh, that's just basically saying you're going in one direction. Technically speaking, you could also copy it below this angle, this ray, excuse me, DF. Okay. Just like when we were copying line segments, technically there were two ways you could do it. Okay. So that's all there is to see for, you can copy angles. Now C5 is just some logic. It says, hey, you've got some angle A, it's congruent to B, it's also congruent to angle C. Well then, hey, all three of those angles are really congruent to each other, and every angle is congruent to itself. Notice both for C4 and for C5, they look exactly the same as our first two congruence axioms for line segments. You just replace all the stuff about line segments and change it over to an angle. Huh? That's it. Now, one last congruence axiom, not gonna lie, this is the one that doesn't look like anybody else. So this one deals with triangles. We're not adding uh, angles like what it feels like you should do if we totally mimic the three line segment congruence axioms. Instead, we're dealing with triangles. So you've got two triangles, and the assumption here is you know that side AB is congruent to side DE. You know that side AC is congruent to DF. And you also know that angle A is congruent to angle D. And I can't remember if we said this earlier or not, but the underlying assumption here is that you are in an incidence geometry. So all three of the incidence axioms work just fine. You also have all of your betweenness axioms holding. You also have the first three congruence axioms for line segments holding, which means behind the scenes, you know how to define your line seg the congruence of line segments. Now, if you have 
these three things being congruent to each other, and let me go ahead and mark them. So AB congruent to DE, angle A congruent to angle D, and AC congruent to DF, any guesses what conclusion we should be getting? Or what conclusion you would love to see? Anybody got a guess? What would we hope to see about these triangles? Yes. So this is totally the setup for side angle side. And it turns out, if you remember back to when we were dealing with Euclid, Euclidean geometry or classical geometry, we use side angle side all the time. It was the building block of so much stuff. Well, Hilbert noticed that too. So he said, you know what? I'm not going to try to prove this thing like what Euclid did. He's like, I'm going to go ahead and actually put it as one of the congruence axioms. So it actually turned out to be this last congruence axiom right here with respect to angles. It actually is a merging of both angles and sides. Um, but side angle side turns out to be your C6 for your last congruence axiom. Okay. So those are the congruence axioms. That's all there is to it for congruence axioms. We got a couple of definitions and propositions I want to highlight for us, and then we're going to jump into some examples and see how this angle stuff is going to be used or could be used inside your model. Now, fair warning, I am not going to focus on the angle congruence that much, mainly because, and you'll see this once we get into the models, it acts very similar to line segment congruence, and in terms of the models that we're going to be using, it acts exactly like you would expect it to act. So there's no weird surprises here like there have been with incidence geometries, weird things happen, or our line segment congruence uh, models from previous that weird things could happen with them too. Okay. So any questions before we move on to some of our definitions, propositions, and then finally examples? All right, seeing nothing, let us move on. So. There are some things that are exactly the same as what we had back with the geometry that Euclid put together. And the first thing is supplementary angles. So this is now the definition in, of supplementary angles in terms of the Hilbert stuff. So here's what you got. I'll draw a picture here. You've got some line. You've got here point A in the middle. D and C are supposed to be on opposite sides of the point A. And you've got then what? You've got some point that actually, it doesn't say this, but some point B that is off the line L. Then these two angles, the angle BAC and the angle BAD are supplementary. Notice the picture here that is horribly drawn is actually looks exactly what you would expect from supplementary angles back in classical geometry and that's because i am on a flat computer screen right here and just attempting to draw straight lines okay but the idea here is you have one straight line and then you've got some other line standing on it except we didn't use that same notation that that same terminology that euclid did we talked about opposite sides here the the same thing that we defined back when we were dealing with betweenness. Okay? So don't overthink it. Supplementary is exactly what you would expect. We're just using some terms that we now have with you, with Hilbert. Okay? Now, one of the big results that comes with supplementary angles is Proposition 9.2. And Proposition 9.2 says, hey, you've got two pairs of supplementary angles. So maybe you got this guy here, uh, BAC. So here's BAC and you've got BAD. So try to draw it the same way that we had before. And you've got a second pair of supplementary angles where your author was too lazy to pick new letters. I'm not going to lie. I try to match the um, terms for these propositions the same way as in your book. Okay. So two pairs of supplementary angles. And suppose you know that BAC and BAC but with primes are congruent to each other. Any guesses what result you should get at this point? What would you expect to then happen in terms of a result? Anybody got a guess? It has to do with this angle. Anybody have a guess on the relationship of that 
B-A-D, but with prime angle. Uh-huh. Yep. So that it turns out the conclusion here is the two BAD angles, one prime version, one not prime version, are going to actually be congruent with each other. Um, so what would happen is this says, hey, you got two pairs of supplementary angles. You get across the two angles. You got two guys that are congruent. Well, of course, the remaining guy is also going to be congruent. In other words, Anytime you tried to add or subtract degrees, that same thing is still true here, and we didn't even talk about degrees. Okay. So that's 9.2, one of the big results dealing with supplementary angles. Um, we also have vertical angles, and remember, vertical angles are when you have two lines that cross are the angles that are opposite. And we also get the same result that we had back in classical geometry, that vertical angles are congruent. Okay. So we have that same uh, property as before. Huh? Questions before I jump to the next slide? Everybody okay? All right, seeing no questions come through, I'm going to move to the next thing. And the next thing deals with addition of angles. And I'm not going to lie, uh, this proposition 9.4 does actually talk about how to add angles, but how it's phrased, it does not feel like that at all. So here's what you've got you've got some angle BAC. And then you have a ray that's in the interior of that angle BAC. So you now have AD as a ray. Now, suppose then you have a second angle. And the second angle, angle DAC, but with primes, is congruent to the first angle DAC. And suppose also we have another angle BAD, but with primes, is congruent to that guy right there. Okay. So we're looking at this. Well, this proposition actually tells you that how to add the angles, but how to add them in such a way that you still always have angles. So key thing here is that new ray AB, with, but with primes, is on the opposite side of the ray AD, but with primes, as the first guy AC. So you're properly adding. Okay? And then the claim here is that BAC, but with primes, does actually form an angle. And not only that, but it actually forms an angle that is congruent to the original angle. Now, here's what all of this actually means in terms of practice. Suppose you've got two angles. I'm going to attempt to make these two angles not look the same. So two horrible angles. If you want to add them together, what you do is you take one of the angles, maybe that first horrible one. Don't move it like I actually did in the picture. Then copy the second angle, again, doesn't matter which one, onto one of the rays of the original angle. And if you do that, the new larger angle will actually be the sum of the original two angles. That's all it's saying. The extra details in this proposition 9.4 guarantee that you actually truly get an angle. And it also is telling you, where to put that new ray that you're copying and make sure you don't actually put this ray AB inside there in a wrong place. Okay. But that's the idea behind adding angles. We're actually not going to need that too much tonight, but if you ever need to add angles, that would be the idea. This is actually the exact same idea of adding angles as in classical geometry. The only difference is dealing with some of these more Hilbert terms to make sure it works not just on a flat piece of paper, pencil, straight edge compass, but in any sort of Hilbert ge geometry that we're going to be dealing with. Now, the thing that we actually use perhaps a little bit more frequently is inequalities of angles. So the next guy that we've got is dealing with how do you determine if angles, which if an angle is less than another angle. So take two angles, say angle A and angle D, and I use the three letter names of angle A and angle D here um, because we're going to copy some angles and add in some extra rays. So what we're going to claim here is we're going to look at the case when angle A is less than angle D. It doesn't matter, I just arbitrarily picked the angle A was less than angle D. Actually, I think I matched the naming convention here to what your book did. So here's the condition. You know angle A is less than angle D, if there exists some ray, we'll call it 
DG here that's in the interior of the larger angle, or what's supposed to be the larger angle. Key that you need to spot is the fact that it's in the interior of the angle. That's the thing that, that's how you know for sure that you've grabbed your larger angle at angle D. Then, what's the key thing, or the second key thing, I guess I should say, the newly formed angle using that ray is actually the smaller of the two angles. Now, let's look at a picture here. So if we go ahead and draw a picture, my horribly hand-drawn picture right here, suppose this is angle A, I'll go ahead and put in the B and the C points to get it all matched up, like up in the definition there. And suppose we have somebody that's supposed to be a larger angle. Note, since I am freehanding this on a flat screen, this is going to give you an example that would that you would also see in the in the geometry that Euclid put together. But you could do this exact same thing in other models too. As long as all the incidence axioms hold, all the betweenness axioms hold, and all six of the congruence axioms hold. Now, here's the deal. This ray DG needs to be where you've copied the smaller angle A inside of the larger angle D. So we're going to go ahead and match up the ray DF and the ray AC. Those guys are going to be corresponding angles. And we're going to go ahead and copy angle A where DF is one of the sides. So if we go ahead and copy that guy, our DG then is where this side AB of the original angle A would copy inside of your angle D. Note, if angle A is smaller, this copied angle, this DG constructed ray right here, will always be in the interior of your angle D, the larger angle. If angle A actually happened to be the bigger of the two angles, that ray DG would be outside of the angle D. And if they happen to be congruent to each other, well, this copied ray DG would actually be on the ray DE. Okay. Questions, make sense, kind of okay-ish. But that would be the check in terms of angle inequalities. Now, we haven't talked about constructions yet, but we're actually going to talk about how you construct things in Hilbert geometries once we get into section 10, which is our next section. All right, seeing no questions come through, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our second to last property and last property that deals with inequalities. So this one goes as follows. Suppose you've got two pairs of congruent angles, very uncreatively calling them a is congruent to A prime, B congruent to B prime. And then turns out angle A is going to be less than angle B. Well, that will only happen if your congruent guys have the same relationship. So A prime less than B prime. Note what this means. This means you can go ahead and do algebra on your inequalities. That's it. That's what it means. Now, there's a second part to this guy. The second part says your inequality relation gives you an order relation. Excuse me, an order relation on your angles. I don't care if you remember the word order relation, but here's what it means. It tells you that if you know angle A is less than angle B and B is less than angle C, you're going to get something automatically. And it guesses what that something is. If you know angle A is less than angle B, angle B is less than angle C, what should you or what would you hope that you would automatically have? Yep. Turns out you should automatically get that angle A is less than angle C. In other words, this is that transitivity property as applied to angles and inequalities. Okay. Now, there's a second part to this part B, and it says if you've got any two angles in your geometry, it doesn't matter which two you pick, but pick any two, you have exactly one of three possibilities happening in terms of how they relate to each other. The first thing is angle A could totally be less than angle B. Second thing is the two angles could actually be congruent to each other. And any guesses what the third and last relationship would be between the angles A and B? Anybody got a guess? Mm -hmm. You could have the inequality the other way. Your angle A could totally be bigger than your angle B. Okay. So order relation here, all it means is you're able to compare things and you'll be able to compare any two 
entities of whatever things you have, in our case, angles. All right? Questions, feeling okay so far? Notice all of these definitions and propositions are totally just saying what you should expect to see with angles, specifically all those things you thought you were automatic, that you automatically have with angles really and truly do happen. But only if you have got the three uh, congruence axioms for angles. So last thing deals with right angles and then we'll jump into an example with a model. So with right angles, the definition of a right angle actually goes hand in hand with the definition of perpendicular lines or now that we're in Hilbert geometry setting, people typically use the word orthogonal lines. I am assuming you guys are okay with orthogonal lines since you theoretically have all been through linear algebra. Hopefully. Okay, it looks like some of you for a yes for that. All right, so just like with classical geometry and Euclid's elements, you totally have right angles and perpendicular lines defined together. So this here is some angle A, which is congruent to its supplementary angle. In other words, bam, your right angles. Okay. And we'll use that, we'll use this uh, quite a bit. Uh, both if you're working with stuff just in section nine and in the future all the time too. Second thing is something that in uh, Euclid's elements was actually a postulate that we didn't prove, but here in Hilbert's geometry, we've got um, is actually a theorem that can be proved. And depending on time, we'll either come back and look at this proof in detail or we'll skip it and I'll just post it. But proposition 9.6 says, pick any two right angles, they should always be congruent to each other. Okay. Hopefully fairly believable. So that's it in terms of axioms, definitions, and extra facts. Any, definite, any questions before we jump into examples? Or really one example that I've got prepped up. All right, saying nothing from you, let us jump to the example. So a little bit of a running start. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull one of the models that we've looked at previously, one of our R2 models. So just to remind ourselves, we're assuming our set of points are all of our ordered pairs where both X and Y are real numbers. Our set of lines are all of our straight lines. The details or the coefficients here all have to be real numbers. And you can't have where both the X and the Y term have disappeared. Huh. Um, between this, your three points have to be three different points. They have to be on one line. And one of those four inequalities have to hold true. At least one of the four inequalities have to hold true. And the big thing that we did when we were looking in section eight with line segment congruence is we looked at defining congruence between line segments by way of some distance function and our different models really change based on our distance function or actually based off of whether we use real numbers or some other type of number. So here's the new part, congruence of angles. So we're still gonna define points the same way, lines the same way, between this the same way. We'll get into different models depending on uh, the distance function dealing with line segments but congruence of angles is just gonna be defined the same way for everybody, which is we're gonna say, hey, angle A is congruent to angle B by way of if the tangent, that trig function tangent of angle A is equal to the trig function tangent of B. So the only issue we've got is how to go ahead and calculate tangent of some angle when we're in one of these Hilbert geometries or one of these models of a Hilbert geometry. Okay. And from previous work, including stuff that I threw to you guys via either a Canvas quiz for between us or homework for congruence axioms, we've actually gone through and either explicitly in class or implicitly in work that you've done, shown that any model of this type actually satisfies all the incidents between us and the first three congruence axioms. So let us look at tangent. So tangents define the following way, and it, this is not the same way you would have seen tangent defined in a trig class or a class that teaches trig. It turns out 
you'll get the same answer, but this is a way to do it off of the lines that form your angle. So here, suppose you've got some angle A. I went ahead and called it by its three-letter name, so BAC. Let me actually do a little picture right down here once we put in the full definition. So M is going to be the slope of one of the rays <coughs> from the angle. Uh, M prime is going to be the slope of the other uh, angle. And we'll go ahead and calculate the tangent is given by that formula. So here, let me go ahead and draw in the picture real quick. We've got B, we've got A, and we've got C. So the tangent of, say, angle A here is you've got your slope for AB was M slope for AC was M prime. So you subtract the difference of those two slopes on the top of the fraction on the bottom. You multiply those two slopes and then add one to it. The absolute value just makes it so that um, which one of the two rays of your angle are chosen as either M or M prime, it doesn't matter. Um, and then the plus or minus out here, we'll go ahead and determine in a different way because it depends what type of angle you have uh, will give you a different type of whether it's positive or negative. Okay. So that's the idea on how to deal with the tangent. Note there are some shortcomings with this formula, and we'll talk about them. Okay. So if your angle is acute, and the definition of acute is if you copy your angle inside of a right angle, it's the angle that's smaller than a right angle. Okay. So if your angle is acute, the tangent of an acute angle should always be positive, so that's how you would know to choose the positive versus the negative part. If your angle is obtuse, and the way you talk about obtuse, this is an angle where the right angle is actually inside the obtuse angle, or the right angle is smaller than the obtuse angle. In this case, this is when your tangent is going to be negative, and that's how you determine the plus or the minus out front. Now, here's the fun part. What happens if you have a right angle? Well, if you have a right angle, the two slopes, when multiplied together, give you negative 1. Any guesses what the problem is if your product of your two slopes equals negative 1? Anybody spot that issue? It's subtle. It is totally right up here in the formula. Yep, you totally got it. If you have that product of M and M prime equal negative one, you're gonna get a divide by zero, and that is totally problematic of giving you a does not exist, or if you prefer an infinity, either way is fine. So, or some sort of does not exist here. Wow, that's a terrible E. Okay. Now, remember how we compare angles. Two angles are congruent to each other if their tangents are congruent. Well, if you get two does not exist for your tangents, Technically, they're not normally considered equal in math, but for this situation, you know, they're both right angles, and that's why we actually have our proposition. I'm sure that's why we have our proposition 9.6 that says, if you've got a right angle, don't worry about using this notion of comparing the tangents of the two right angles. We know automatically they're already congruent to each other. So that would be the idea here with tangents. The other issue with using tangents, is you've got to watch out for vertical angles, not vertical angles, vertical lines. Anybody have a guess of why vertical lines could cause issues with this formula? Again, it comes back to the formula of why there's an issue. It's not a divide by zero this time. So suppose you have this angle. This one, no worries. You got a slope just fine. You plug it in, it's whatever it is, maybe one. But what would be the issue if we labeled that other angle M prime? What would be the problem with the slope M prime? Yep, it's undefined. And if you try to find, plug an undefined number into a formula, again, issues. So this is one of the places where if you actually need to calculate that tangent, what you would do is you would actually, you would essentially have to copy your angle somewhere to a different orientation so you don't have a vertical a vertical ray that forms part of your angle. Now, pluses, while you might have to use all of this stuff in a much more abstract or complicated model, for the models that we've been playing around with in R2, 
all of this stuff corresponds exactly to just looking at the degree of the angle like you normally would, where you might throw a protractor down on your picture and actually measure the angle and just grab the degrees of your angle. So that same thing I totally let you guys do back when we were dealing with the classical geometry of just, hey, throwing everything into the degrees, that actually still works here with, don't forget, the degrees of your angle for guys that are defined as angles are still only going to be between 0 and 180 degrees, not including 0 or 180 degrees. Because they're called something different. This one with zero would just be a single ray, and the guy with 180 would just be a, a line. I say that because we're about to jump into a picture, and you'll easily be able to tell what type of angles these are just visually. But if you try to plug it into the formula, I've got one of the angles, unfortunately, has a vertical line in it. Okay. So any questions before we jump to the example inside of a model? Okay. So seeing no questions come through, let us look at our example. Now, just to remind ourselves, the four models that we've looked at so far in terms of our models on our, uh, our models on R2 is our standard model that has our standard distance dealing with square roots right there. We've got our taxi cab model that you will see if you haven't already quite a bit in homework set eight. That is just the sum of the differences of the x and the y coordinates. Our soup model, which is the maximum of the difference of the x versus the y coordinates. And then our double model, that was our piecewise function, where if you've got a vertical or horizontal line that you're looking at, it's just a standard model distance function, but in all of the slanted line cases, it's twice whatever that standard distance was. Okay, so that's our brief reminder. We're about to look at one of these three models, and the one model that we're going to look at is the soup model, and I went ahead and put the distance right here at the top for us to remind ourselves the distance function in this particular soup model, or I guess really any soup model, is the maximum of the absolute value of the x-coordinates versus the absolute value of the y-coordinates. I went ahead and threw that up there at the top for us. Now, here's the question, or the initial question that we want to ask about this situation is, See the picture right there? We've got two triangles, triangle ABC, where point B of that triangle is at the origin, and we've got triangle DEF, which is moved a little bit further on down the x-axis. What we want to know is, are these two triangles congruent to each other or not? So that's the question. Are the two triangles congruent to each other? There's our question we want to look at. Now, second thing that we want to know is, what is the definition of congruent triangles. Anybody remember the definition of congruent triangles? That's my horrible little sloppy handwriting comes up right there. Anybody remember definition of congruent triangles? Don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. Yep. To all of you guys who are responding back, uh, all of your sides and all of the corresponding angles have to be congruent. So that does tell us that we actually have six pieces of information uh, that need to be checked. Okay? So every pair of sides, there's three for a triangle. Every pair of uh, angles, there's three more that you would check that would need to be congruent. So that would be. So there's your six items that you would need to check, okay? Now, I'll start us off with one of them, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this question to you guys. So just as a heads up in terms of what I've already set up uh, before we started tonight, is I've set us up already where I can throw you into groups like we demoed previously. Some of you have already been tagged as the presenter of the group, if you are the presenter of a group, you should have some sort of little question that pops up on your screen as soon as I throw you into our group sessions that says, hey, are you okay with being the presenter? You can select yes or no. This is a heads up. If you select yes, you do then need to make it so that everybody else can talk in your group. If some of your group members don't have mics, that's okay. Um, 
you guys can totally use the little chat feature in the room. Those of you who are presenters, you can also share your screen. You can make it so uh, the webcam so you guys can see each other. And you can also give permission for somebody else to be a presenter so they can share their work if they're writing on something that electronic that can be shared. Okay? If you are currently on something like a cell phone or a tablet where you're sort of ad hocing in here, you may not have full features to be able to make it so everybody in the group can talk to each other. So if that's the case, when the first pop-up window says, hey, are you cool with being a presenter? You may need to hit no, and then it should automatically ask the next person in the group. Otherwise, please hit yes and get the session started. Okay. So pulling back to the actual question here. So to get us started, we're looking at the two triangles. We've got triangle ABC and triangle DEF. If we want to check that these guys are congruent, what's something we have to worry about? We have to worry about, hey, what would be the distance of each of our lines segments, each of our sides? Are those distances equal to each other? If so, the line segments would be congruent. And then for the angles, you'd need to worry about, hey, does the tangent of that angle, or if you prefer the degree of that angle, are they the same on both corresponding angles across the two triangles? And you'd need to worry about this for a couple of different things. So for example, if we went ahead and focused here on line segment AB, what would be the distance for line segment AB? Anybody have a guess? Yes, the distance for, for line segment AB would totally be one, and then you could do that, say, for like all of your line segments. You could then look at all of your angles in a similar way, okay? Kind of makes sense what you're supposed to be doing. So the goal here to repeat it is, we wanna check to see if these two triangles are going to be congruent.